This weekend's activities mark the final chapter in a year of absolutely amazing events celebrating these two centennials. And on behalf of the organizing committee for tonight and the WBCA, Jay and I would like to welcome you all to the talk this evening. So tonight marks the centennial to the day of the completion of the Nordheimer Bridge section of the St. Clair Streetcar Line, a symbol of permanence that St. Clair West had arrived. It's great to see everyone here tonight to hear uh, Edward Keenan uh, deliver the public keynote uh, talk of the symposium this weekend. Edward is the senior editor of The Grid and author of Some Great Idea, Good Neighborhoods, Crazy Politics, and the Invention of Toronto. And copies of the book are available with many other retailers uh, from, uh, from Book City. There are two other public events taking place at the Barnes this weekend as part of the Urban Transformation Symposium. The Peter McKendrick Community Gallery on the northeast corner of the Barnes features a photographic exploration of St. Clair West through the last century, titled Timed Exposures to St. Clair West. It's open tonight until 10 p.m. and also tomorrow and Sunday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And on Sunday, join us for a Heritage Toronto guided walking tour, leaving at 10.30 a.m. from the west entrance of the bar, so that's behind you. Um, you will explore the area's historical and architecturally significant sites. The WBCA is really excited to bring you events like the Centennial, but we also do all kinds of other things. Things like our annual Blue at the Barns, we have a mobile app that's called Discover St. Clair, we just did a recent dance series where you can learn to boogie woogie. We're also working on a digital storytelling project that will present oral histories from current and former residents. But we want to do more. And you can help us to do that by volunteering. There are sign-up sheets at the uh, door, just at uh, tables or pardon me, just by the uh, entrance door. And another really great way to participate is to attend our party ticket to ride that will be happening on September the 19th, right here in the Barnes. It's going to be a great event. We're actually going to turn the Barnes into a streetcar. And you'll be taking a fantastic ride through all kinds of exciting things. There will be great entertainment, food and drink, and we'd love to see you there. So just check the website in July for more information. So if you've been, one, if you've been wondering what the uh, large white street map over the wall, um, over by the wall there is, well that is Map It, Your St. Clair West an interactive activity where you can literally leave your mark on the avenue. So if you haven't done so already, we uh, highly encourage you to add your comments, your memories about St. Clair after the, uh, after the talk. You'll also want to check out, as I mentioned, the Book City's table behind you where they have a number of great titles that explore Toronto. And we'd like to take this opportunity right now, like any of these kind of events, it would never happen without the support of a lot of really generous sponsors. So we'd like to thank the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, or SHRC, the Wilson Institute for Canadian History at McMaster University, and at York University, thanks to the History Department, the Abbey Bennett Historical Chair in Canadian History, the Robards Center for Canadian Studies, the City Institute, and the Faculty of Environmental Studies. We also want to thank Artscape for their ongoing support of the WBCA, and to Steam Whistle and Bob Brown for their contributions to this event. But a really special thank has to go out to the renowned artist John Cover, who's also a Barnes resident. If you haven't checked out the great illustrations on the map, they're all of John's originals. Of course, we want to thank all the great volunteers that have helped us to put this event on because we couldn't do it without you. And lastly, a really big thank you to the other two members of the organizing committee, Michelle Matter. WBCA member as well, and Daniel Ross from York University. And also a great thanks to uh, Matt Casper who designed the beautiful, uh, very uh, exciting uh, postcards and posters to publicize the event tonight. Um, so now it's our pleasure to introduce you to the host of tonight's event, Dr. Sean Karaj. Sean is a professor of history at um, York University uh, in the history department there. His research focuses on Canadian urban and environmental history, and he is the author of Inventing Stanley Park and Environmental History, which was recently published by UBC Press. And even though it's actually about Vancouver, Book City is still selling it behind us. We'll let that one slide. <laughs> um, but Sean, we'd like you to take a this. Thank you. Um, if anybody has searched the word Rob Ford on Twitter in the last 12 
12 months, 18 months, Edward's Twitter account will come up at some point. Um, and for many of you, that may have been how you've encountered his writing. But he's in fact written about uh, municipal issues, and a variety of issues that affect, uh, that address lot, uh, aspects of life in the city that affect our everyday lives uh, for quite a long time. Um, he's a contributing editor uh, at Spacing Magazine. He's the author of this excellent book, Some Great Idea, which you can purchase for a very reasonable price just over at the Book City table. Uh, he's an 11 time nominee for National Magazine Awards. Um, but perhaps most importantly for the subject matter tonight, uh, Edward is a Toronto born writer who has previously worked in a number of different occupations, some of which include a restaurant owner, a cook, an office administrator, a carnival barker, a chemical <laughs> factory laborer, and a walking courier. He's lived in uh, River, uh, Riverside and in Scarborough and now lives in uh, the Junction, uh, but in the north part of the Junction, is that right? Uh, he, uh, his writing covers the city, its politics, arts, uh, issues of sexuality, and sports, a wide range of issues. His work can be found in the grid, spacing, uh, previously in I Weekly, uh, Mesnov, uh, Walrus, Toronto Star. He hosts a radio show on News Talk 1010, which airs on Sundays at 10 p.m. And in that very little space in between all this writing, the radio show, a podcast at some point as well, he'll be speaking to us tonight. He thinks and he writes about neighborhoods. What works, what doesn't work? How can our politics make better neighborhoods? Why do we sometimes fail? Why do we sometimes succeed? And tonight, he's looking at this neighborhood, St. Clair West, the building blocks of urban vitality. Edward King. Him of the wreck of the streetcar St. Clair so often and so vividly that it's heartening to see the survivors cuddling together like this for strength. <laughs> of course, if you're here for a talk like this, at a symposium like this, in a place like this, you already know well that anyone visiting St. Clair West today will find it far from disastrous. Instead, it offers much to celebrate plenty that fascinates, and it has a lot to teach us about the city we live in, about where we came from, how we became the kind of place we are, how we should continue to grow. As I've prepared for this talk, turning my thinking to this often unsung Toronto High Street, not as prominent in the imagination of the city as your Queen Street Wests, or your Young Streets, or your 401s, I've been amazed at the many ways it reflects the evolution of Toronto's history, demonstrate some of the most important principles of great neighborhood and city building, of community building, the very same principles that made Toronto the great city that it is, as I discuss in my book, Some Great Idea, Good Neighborhoods, Crazy Politics, and the Invention of Toronto, which you can find for sale at a table just over there. <clears throat> These are lessons we need to have in mind right now, during the municipal election year, at the conclusion four years or more, two decades more or less, of contentious and often outright insane city politics. I think St. Clair West offers a handy frame to consider some of those things, and I want to thank the organizers of this symposium, particularly J. Young and Daniel Ross, who I've been uh, speaking to alongside their colleagues at York University and the other universities that were mentioned in the introduction, and the people here at the Barnes, for giving me the opportunity to consider this place and these things and to share some of my reflections with you today. You can feel free to applaud the organizers of this now. <laughs> Sometimes when you go to a speech, they ask you to hold your applause till the end, but I would encourage you, if you hear something you agree with or you feel deserves cheering, you just go ahead and let it out. Don't bottle that stuff up. Yeah. Not healthy to bottle it up and express it. However, I would ask you to say you're booing till the end. <laughs> like if you disagree and you want to express that, save it for the part of the evening's events that takes place in your home, much later <laughs> tonight. Uh, in the privacy of your living room, you can be like, boo! You took a shot at Caesar Palazzo right in the introduction. Pocket your book. And that way, that's a healthy way to express that. Alternately, you can uh, express your thoughts in the form of a question a little later on when Sean joins me on stage here. 
you know, that's the kind of thing you prefer. Um, you know, the asking you to save your boom, uh, your derision until the end is uh, sort of a dement defense mechanism because uh, as is so often the case for me, I suspect that tonight I'm going to be talking about many things that some of you know more about than me. Uh, history, urban planning, life and work on St. Clair West. I'm not an expert on these things. I have virtually no formal training in them. Uh, I'm an observer who's looked at them attentively, attentively if unsystematically, for the past 10 years or so. And I've been lucky enough to make a job out of doing that, so I'm happy to share those reflections with you tonight. I was reminded recently that George Orwell wrote that sometimes things get to the point that the first duty of intelligent men is to restate the obvious. Uh, so without inflating my own intelligence, I'll attempt to uh, do that tonight, do a bit of restating the obvious. I am personally in debt to our wise civic ancestors who decided to put a St. Clair, a streetcar on St. Clair. I live at the west end of the streetcar line in the stockyards area of the junction near St. Clair and Keel. Almost every day, I choose to ride the streetcar. From my home, it's actually a little faster for me to travel to work by a different route, getting on the Keel bus, going down to the subway station, transferring again to St. George. If I'm in a rush, I can save 10 minutes by going that way. But the streetcar on St. Clair is just uh, so much better. I get on the first stop out of Guns Loop, and I get to ride through neighborhoods to see people and places, to be in the city as I travel. There's a cornball streetcar driver who's often on the St. Clair West route, who always calls out, Toasted Western, at Old Western Road, for no reason I can determine, except to liven things up. And it makes it a more interesting ride. And in so many ways, the streetcar is just a more interesting ride than the Keel bus or the subway. It's also, I get a seat where I get on, and I save the transfer, so there's that too. But I feel as though streetcars are the iconic Toronto method of transportation. I grew up with a bedroom overlooking Gerard Street East, with streetcars rolling past every so often, night and day, full of hundreds of people. Railway lines that connect neighborhoods just as our great national railways connect the provinces and cities of this country. Streetcars rattle as they pass, but they're smooth when you're riding on them. And an awesome way to move through the city, not just to move through the city, but to see it as you do it. From the slightly elevated perch peering in the shop windows and restaurant patios, you can know places to hop off when there's time to linger. And of course, you get to visit some parts of the line when your car gets short term. Hello, Earl's Court, my old friend. In the 1970s, there was a plan to scrap streetcars in Toronto, but a committed group of residents fought to save them. And now many cities across North America are building or rebuilding their own streetcar lines. They're not uh, without controversy, but we'll get to that later. In any event, streetcars are built into my conception of what Toronto is. And of course, they're built into what St. Clair Avenue is, too. That's the case for so many essential Toronto things. You find them exemplified on St. Clair. Just this week, I walked the length of the St. Clair streetcar line, from Young Street in the east to Guns Loop in the west. It's a good long, a long one. Makes you appreciate the streetcar option that's there. But there's so much to see in the neighborhoods of this street that was once a scattering of small towns on the outskirts of Toronto. Deer Park, Forest Hill, Beacon Bend, Brackendale Village, that's, that's where we are now, Carlton Village, West Toronto Junction. Then they became suburbs, then uptown, then midtown, and finally in the lexicon of our current political debates, downtown. There's so much Toronto history and the evolution of the city that you can read on the street there. There's the longtime home of the St. Mike's Majors hockey team near Bathurst Street, which was for generations part of the farm system of the Toronto Maple Leafs, the place where the world came to know Ted, came to know Ted Lindsay, Frank Mahovlich, Tim Horton, Jerry Cheevers, Dave Keon, Red Kelly. These are important people to me. Uh, there, Father David Bauer recognized him such a Canadian statement. 
Hockey as both an expression of God's glory and a builder of character. And from there, he founded the first National Olympic Hockey Program. The majors were affiliated with St. Michael's College, still are, I think, uh, of course. Just one of the private institutions on St. Clair or within a few blocks of it where the city's establishment has been educated. There's Upper Canada College, which has graduated three premiers, four mayors of Toronto, seven chief justices, and six lieutenant governors. There's another old boy from up UCC trying to become mayor now, maybe five. Uh, De La Salle College, where I attended for a year, just a year. The Bishop's Drawn School. Over at Oakwood is the public high school that gave us politician Stephen Lewis, journalist Patrick Watson, R&B singer Julie Black, and Bob Ezrin, produced Pink Floyd's The Wall album with its iconic single that told us we don't need no education. I don't know if that's a reflection of the educational institutions of St. Clair or not. But. Wandering along St. Clair West, you encounter a park named, Glen, named for Glenn Gould, near where he once lived, a church named for Timothy Eaton, where World War I flying ace Billy Bishop was married, you can see the tip of Casa Loma, the ridiculous and beautiful mansion that was Henry Pollard's monument and his downfall after he brought hydroelectricity to Toronto. Ironically, I read it was the energy bills that finally bankrupted. <laughs> you pass just north of Butchwood Park, the once gated artist community that was home to Marmaduke Matthews and Marshall McLuhan. In the East End at Young is the just-closed CFRB studio where Raleigh Crowder was the voice of Toronto Mornings, just north of the 1050 Chum building where Toronto met the Beatles and rock and roll, and the CBC studio where Mr. Dressup rummaged around in his tickle trunk. At the western end you see Hayden House, once a railway hotel, the site of a famous brawl that led to uh, alcohol sales being prohibited in Junction, uh, a prohibition that lasted until 2000. And in the very west end, there's the stockyards, once the province's largest livestock market, home to Toronto's meatpacking industry, an essential element of cocktail. I could go on, but what I'm saying is that these are people that you encounter on St. Clair West who did things, places where things happened, where the city was built. It's culture, literature, sports, industry and politics, their names and legacy are inscribed on the street. Their giant footprints are there for us to walk in. But what I'm not saying is that it's a museum preserved for commemoration. It's anything but that. In the tradition of Toronto, the streets show evolution, sometimes really messy, sometimes you wouldn't call it beautiful to look at it. It's hodgepodge rather than carefully planned. I discuss in my book why I think that quality is important in all the places you see in Toronto that work really well. I try to look at the identity of this city that sometimes seems to have so little definition to its identity. And in the city's history, I focused on three qualities that I think have made Toronto what it is, that have built its successes in the places it's been successful. And I think you can see all of these three qualities in action on St. Clair Wells. The first is diversity. It's there in the city's model. We all know diversity, our strength. And it's there on St. Clair Avenue. I happen to be walking along the street in the middle of the World Cup. You can see lineups outside the bars in the middle of the day, flag-waving supporters of Mexico. The next day on the streetcar, I encountered more flag-waving supporters, this time of Chile. Today, you would have seen them from Italy and Portugal. In the various neighborhoods of St. Clair West, you find the institutions of the traditional Protestant and Catholic establishment of Toronto, as I mentioned. But you also find the historical markers of the oldest Jewish social club in the city, the monument to Italian immigrants, with its cry and letter set in stone in two languages, I speak, peace, peace, peace. You find Albert's Real Jamaican Foods, and Dutch Dreams ice cream shop at Vaughn, just moved a little bit down the street there recently. You find people from across Latin America and the Caribbean, significant numbers of Filipinos, 
and a growing number of halal food stores. You can notice some of the ethnic group tribalism that is sometimes the fallen Toronto neighborhoods, but across the breadth of the street, you see a mixture of voices from around the world together, like in a chorus, that you can hear on the street. But of course, diversity, as it's defined in our motto, is not just about multiculturalism, not when we talk about how cities are built, how neighborhoods work. Toronto's strength and St. Clair's comes from so many more forms of it, along the breadth of this streetcar line, you see people from across the economic spectrum. And you see, looking closely at the street, a mixture of types of places, too. Different uses of building types and heights. There are blocks of traditional Toronto single-family homes, detached and semi-detached townhouses, running up and down the side streets in blocks around St. Clair. There are residential apartment towers, mid-rises and high-rises, that define apartment living in Toronto well before the current condo boom. In fact, there's a building on St. Clair uh, near Walmer Road, on Walmer Road, that's a, it's a high-rise of rental apartment tower that's celebrating this weekend 50 years on the street. It was preceded by deco and modernist towers at least a generation older than that. It will be followed by new condos whose presentation centers are only just now open. People shop and work and go to school in the neighborhoods along St. Clair too, as they always have. The storefronts and restaurants and bars are the most noticeable part of it for a visitor, mostly in the small form that we've come to understand as making a great place walkable, because it offers variety and visual interest. But there's also, especially out at the West End in the old stockyard, some experiments in urbanizing big box stores and reinventing the old model of a mall. We'll see how successful those are after a while, alongside new townhouses there. But also, they exist alongside remaining industrial uses. There are manufacturers, a rail to truck, warehouse complex, meat processing plants, car repair shops. People still work there along the rail lines, making things in Toronto. And people work in almost all the neighborhoods along St. Clair West. There are government and institutional buildings, other kinds of white collar employers, and again, the very architectural styles of the time they were built. One of them, a modernist concrete insurance tower, was a draft design for Toronto City Hall that Nathan Phillips rejected. This diversity of the types of buildings and the uses of buildings, it's important, though it's easy enough to overlook. And it's something the builders of newer suburbs did overlook. Something I sometimes fear some of those building new condo communities in Toronto still are the law. That the diversity of uses and building types are a big part of what makes a neighborhood thrive, especially because almost all of it meets the street at a walkable scale. People can work and eat and live and celebrate World Cup victories or otherwise in the same street, meet each other on foot as they do. The second important principle that I identify in my book is democracy, which I take to mean a sense of community, active citizenship, of the inclusion of people in the processes. Once again, you see that on St. Clair, in the community gardens on Old Weston Road, in the web of business and group areas that bring a form of local government to neighborhood commercial communities, in the many proud residence associations in all the historic communities along the street. There's a landmark of sorts, of significance to all of Toronto that really captures the spirit of local democracy here. It's a well-told story uh, because it's a landmark noteworthy for not what's not there. At Spadina today, there's a park, among other things, but there's not a highway. In the mania for road travel that gripped North America in the 1950s and 1960s, a highway network snaking through the city was planned and partly built. The Don Valley Parkway and the Gardner Expressway came first. Next up was the Spadina Expressway. It was built as far south as Lawrence and was to have continued down through Forest Hill, across St. Clair, of course, through the annex and beyond. 
I don't think I need to remind this audience necessarily of how a group of residents from St. Clair and from the Annex and the other communities affected by it, led by Jane Jacobs and John Sewell, and Colin Vaughan, including Marshall McLuhan and plenty of other university professors, led a successful movement to stop the highway. They had to fight the municipal government at the time, the city government, the metro government. They finally found an ally in the provincial premier, Bill Davis, who said when he canceled it famously, if we were building a city for cars, this would be a good place to start. If we're building a city for people, this is a good place to stop. There were, there were echoes of that fight and the sentiments expressed in it on both sides of the debate around the St. Clair Street car right away. Maybe we'll come back to that in a little bit, but as long as we're talking about the corner of St. Clair and Spadina, I want to point out another significant landmark there. Winston Churchill Park and the St. Clair Reservoir. In my book, I talk about the other key, I think, to Toronto's success, which is infrastructure and the necessity to build it properly. I focused a lot in this book on the story of R.C. Harris, the powerful works commissioner in the uh, early 20th century and the post-war period, who built much of Toronto as we now know it, the sidewalks, the bridges, that we still use today. When he came to office, the city had a disastrously bad water quality problem. The rate of death for children from bacterial infections and other waterborne illnesses was sky high, an international disgrace. He embarked on updating it, building the new the sewage system that we're partly just now updating 100 years later. And famously, he built the water, the palace of water filtration that bears his name out in the beaches. Part of his vision included expanding infrastructure to serve not just the crisis of the city as it was then, not just the crisis the city then faced, which was really focused in the then downtown area, especially uh, the slums of the ward, which cover the area uh, that, that where now City Hall now sits, but also the needs of the city as it would become. It was that that motivated him to want to build things out into what were then the suburbs, the far reaches of Toronto, including a plan to install a giant water tower in the then suburban area of St. Clair. He was supported in that ambition by local Forest Hill residents, but opposed by pen-pitching bureaucrats and politicians who objected to the $130,000 price tag that it carried with it. The water tower never got built. But in the late 1920s, the reservoir was constructed with its magnificent stone entrances embedded under the park that now exists and still serves as a local gathering place today. R.C. Harris's fingerprints, uh, like there at St. Clair and Spadina, are all over the city. In the sidewalk and bridge network he built, the water infrastructure we still use today, the streetcar network that he amalgamated and expanded as the predecessor to today's TTC. It's something we sometimes seem to have forgotten. We're still fighting, as he did, when he wanted to build the St. Clair Water Tower, and famously, when he wanted to build the Bloor Viaduct and include a subway corridor underneath it generations before we ever have a subway. We still find, as he did, the people who say the infrastructure we need, or will need, is too extravagant to spend money on. So diversity, democracy, infrastructure, these are the things that we built Toronto by fostering and encouraging. And these are the things that you find in the history of St. Clair West. Now, let's talk about the streetcar right away. It's an example of infrastructure building in recent memory. And you may have heard that it's not uncontroversial. In fact, it featured prominently in two different election campaigns. In 2006, when it was about to be constructed, when David Miller planted visions of it as a sort of above-ground subway, a model of the LRT building we were then talking about embarking on, planning on embarking on, and again in 2010, when it was recently opened after a drawn-out, painful, and radically over-budget building process, when Rob Ford held it up as a disaster. It's neither of those things 
course. What it is, I think, in my experience, is a very good streetcar line that suffers from some plan, it suffered from some planning and execution problems, uh, both in its construction and sometimes in its operation today. The street, as you can tell just by walking down, it seems to be thriving alongside the street. Ridership was up in 2012 by more than 15% over, pre over the pre-construction period. Collisions are down. Car traffic, despite some hiccups, seem to move along just fine. Real estate prices and condo construction seem to indicate a neighborhood that people love all the whole, right? Or a series of neighborhoods, actually, all the way along it, uh, that people love all. Some of them uh, are still struggling, especially out here on Western Road. But uh, they were struggling before, and will come maybe a bit to struggles as we move along. We can learn from the hiccups that we see both in its operation and in its construction. It's still a mystery why the different agencies respond to, responsible for building it and the infrastructure that went with it couldn't coordinate their various work from having to reopen the street multiple times and driving up the budget. It's still a mystery to me why the bridge near Old Western Road was not widened to avoid the bottlenecks that have become a routine feature of that segment of the street, where all east-west traffic for a whole segment of the city is choked into one lane in each direction. It's a mystery to me, and an ongoing frustration, that it was sold to the public as a sort of an LRT in action when it's actually an old-fashioned streetcar right the way like we have on Spadina. And I think the decision to allow so much parking on the street instead of, say, opening more green PD lots on side streets nearby was a mistake. We're still sorting out the left turns, how to make them work best, but I think overall it works. And I think and hope we can learn from the planning and construction errors as we embark on new projects. I think we can also learn that building infrastructure, transit infrastructure, or any other kind is not painless. It's long and hard and messy, and all of these projects go over budget. All of these projects seem to take forever. And, and that actually causes real pain, as the merchants on the street here in St. Clair learn, as the merchants on Eglinton are now learning. Um, you know, when you are invested in your future, when you're building infrastructure that will pay off in the long term, there are short-term problems, but we have to deal with those problems if we're going to get to the place we want to be. I, I hope, St. Clair, my observation of St. Clair West is that in the longer term, it, it demonstrates itself how worth it is. There were many people who predicted disaster, and an organized group of residents, not crazy people, but genuinely concerned and motivated local business owners and residents thought its construction. Many of them still point to the shortcomings they see in it. Council Joe Mahavik, who's here tonight, I think, had to fight at least one election against the leaders of, of the groups that opposed him. He won those elections. But respectfully to those people who, who opposed it and continue to oppose it, I, um, I disagree, but I thank them for their voices in debate because I think it helped make the process better than it could have been. It helped to some extent, maybe, to improve the design. But it's heartening to me to see that the process includes places for genuine debate. And I think we can learn from conflict because, again, as I discussed in my book, I think that diversity and democracy, whether you're talking about building infrastructure or anything else, come with, they come with conflict built right into them. It's, it's conflict is the way we learn about each other's needs, and it's the way we refine ideas. It's often painful and ugly, and in the past of this city, our conflict has uh, involved like attempted armed rebellions. But as the debate about St. Clair and transit in general in this city shows, it's, it's also often very, very frustrating to participate in. One man's disaster is another woman's success and it can be hard often to even realize that they're talking about the same stretch of road or the same city. But we need them both. We need all of them, all of us, in the conversation. Uh, you know, that's something that we've 
encountered a lot, I think, in the last four years here, as our politics has seemed to be more divisive. Um, conflict in which participants in the debate don't even seem to be talking about the same thing. They don't acknowledge the same set of facts. But um, I think to look on the right side, we're having a pretty vigorous, heated debate about, say, public transit, about infrastructure, about condo construction in the city. And it's one that we really need to have. But to sum up a part of this, I think it's no mystery why St. Clair West is a series of relatively thriving communities. The building blocks of vitality have always been here. It's a mixed use, mixed income, mixed building type, multicultural community with great transportation and social infrastructure, with involved active residents, diversity, democracy, infrastructure. These things are built right into St. Clair as it exists. There's maybe a great example of how these things come together as the community evolves right here in this building in the unscathed Richwood Gardens. A great historic piece of infrastructure, a streetcar barn built just over 100 years ago to serve what was then the suburbs and small towns. But as Toronto and its streetcar housing needs change, it has become, as Jane Jacobs said, an old building that's home to a new idea. Artscape, in partnership with the city and I think with some funding from the federal government, has transformed it into a new kind of community cultural center. Food, music, the arts, uh, nonprofit community groups, even walking symposia make use of it as a civic resource, a place for citizens to come together as they create the next version of this neighborhood and of this city in the Q&A, but I can't pretend that the city can learn everything it needs to know about dealing with its current problems by looking here at the Witchwood Barnes or at St. Clair West. We confront a political scene that even before it became dominated by the character flaws of one man, was facing real challenges, divisions exaggerated but real between suburb and city, Travelers on bikes and transit building cars, increasingly between the rich and the poor, and ethnic groups who, though we're more diverse than we ever have been, seem to be sorting into distinctly different areas of the city away from each other. We're suffering because parts of this city did not evolve as St. Clair West did, as a streetcar suburb at human scale, but were, were, were built to alienating scale in a few decades of this guy that planet. We're wrestling with a generation or more of neglect for this city's infrastructure. We can't erase it all and build a new, and we shouldn't, even if we could. But I think, as we face how to resolve these conflicts and talk about how to move forward in this monumental election and beyond, we do well to keep in mind these lessons that I've outlined that work for us here the way this place and other famously successful neighborhoods of the city have grown and built on their histories and evolved through diversity, democracy, and good infrastructure, built and adapted and rebuilt through messy, contentious conflicts and through bold new ideas that respect history and community. We'll need that kind of process, those kind of ideas, as we've been talking about how to expand good infrastructure out into Scarborough, North of Togo, and Togo. I should say as we continue talking about how to expand good infrastructure, transit and otherwise, out into Scarborough, into Togo, into parts of North Florida. As we confront a rhetoric that talks about things like the war on the car uh, and that views every investment in the city in good planning as some kind of plot against suburban residents and a tax and spend a scheme to uh, impoverish Rob Ford and his friends and supporters. And as we look at the uh, concrete towers in a park that line the major streets of our suburban areas in Toronto, as we look at the oceans of parking lot that line those major streets, and we try to think about how adaptive re reuse applies to those, we will need uh, I was going to say the kind of creativity that went into this place and other places, 
but it made me more creativity than that, more ideas, and more um, of the sort of vision that builds the city for the future and for the needs of the people who live in the neighborhood so that all the neighborhoods in the city can enjoy the kind of um, active, uh, vibrant life that you find here on St. Clair West. That's how we built this city, and that's how, if we're going to be successful, we're going to build the city that we will become. That's it for my year. Parts of the city 
that are least well, that have the least building blocks for vitality as the title of this talk has, right? Um, so I, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, diversity has always been a big key strength of Toronto, and I think there's the potential for it to be a huge strength going forward. But the challenge we face is finding uh, language, um, finding techniques that allow the conflicts that are arising out of this, um, these differences to be settled. Like, that we can think of ourselves, we, we have a hard time thinking of ourselves as one city with common interests that are going to um, succeed or fail together. But I think the reality is that in, in most cases that's the case. And um, my hope uh, given that, as I mentioned, like a lot of this, a lot of this friction, uh, which has generated a lot of heat, I'm hoping that it's also generated some light. But the fact that we're having this interminable subway LRT debate, and we're we're being forced to constantly discuss, um, you know, what our taxes pay for, and why that is, or isn't worth it. That that our politicians at City Hall are forced to have these very public and very bitter debates, um, that that would land us eventually at a place that allows those, those different viewpoints, which in this debate, I mean, I think it's important that, uh, that people who see the world as I do, who see the sense of St. Clair West in, in many ways in modern language, um, I think they need to participate in that debate. But I think when you hear uh, a lot of the rhetoric that's often bitter and angry, uh, it's expressing symptoms of real problems that need to be addressed. And I think it's important that those symptoms are brought right to the forefront of our attention and that they become the focus of our debate. Because as I say, my hope is that once they're a focus of debate, I, I hope uh, democracy will produce the smartest answer. And, and I hope that at the end of it, we will see ourselves uh, and our goals more it's, it's, I mean, the three city study that you point out in this book and that you use really effectively to show over the last 10 years, like the rest of Canada, that we think of as a multicultural nation, when we look at it at the ground level, it's actually multicultural in its three metropolises, in Vancouver, and in Montreal, and in Toronto. And in most other parts of the country, it's not quite as ethnically diverse. But as you show in the book at the ground level in the city of Toronto, in the last decade, the city's become less diverse in the old city um, and more ethnically diverse in the inner suburbs. Yeah, and I mean, to some extent, that um, that already existed. The sort of the cultural mosaic, the map was also already a mosaic. Um, you know, Cabbage Town was a Irish slum. Um, Chinatown, right, it's named because it was a landing place for Chinese immigrants. But again, um, these parts of the city were built and it, and it wasn't like the wisdom of uh, our city's founders uh, that, that the city was built at a scale that seemed to allow these things to work really well. It was just like technology didn't exist. The car was not commonplace enough to allow us to, to think, oh, well, you know, you could drive uh, to a job at Richmond and Queen from Mississauga. Sure you could, like, uh, on horse, horseback. That was a much longer journey, right? Um, so, but, the built form of the city uh, creates those challenges. So when we're talking about uh, the kind of ethnic self-sorting that has to some extent always characterized um, neighborhoods that are side by side in Toronto, they're no longer side by side, they're separated by vast differences. And, and my thinking anyway is that those geographic differences uh, translate almost into psychological differences because of the differences in lifestyle that they contain. Right, and in addition to challenges in terms of ethnic diversity in the city, you also point out about socioeconomic diversity, uh, that a lot of the prosperity of the last decade was experienced in the city center and not shared evenly. So of the kind of benefits of livability that we can see in the neighborhood like St. Clair West, um, how do you see the kind of positive aspects or characteristics of the prosperity that this kind of neighborhood has experienced being exported into the uh, inner suburbs, or should it be exported? 
Uh, or how can we bring that kind of prosperity that this neighborhood has experienced to other neighborhoods in Toronto? Yeah, that's a question worth a lot of. Um, because it's a tough one, and it's maybe the, like the key question that, that we deal with. I think, um, in addition to the other challenges that I've been talking about, um, I mean, there are people in the inner suburbs who still love the way of life thing, right? Like, it's I, when you generalize, you're, you're leaving quite a lot. Out. There are still um, many people of various ethnicities downtown. There are, there are still poor people downtown, increasingly concentrated in social housing. But there are still also, you know, middle income people. But we see these larger trends. Um, but I think a lot of the, the have-not perception that exists um, in the old city of York, in Scarborough, and especially north of Tobacco, uh, has to do with the socioeconomic status of a lot of people who live there, but it also really has to do with the lack of infrastructure that exists there, right? I mean, one problem is that you have to travel everywhere by car, but the, the other problem is that, that you have to, right? Because there's not good transit there. Um, but also, like, the kind of Soft infrastructure, social infrastructure, places like this. Um, you just don't have them in every neighborhood in the city. You, you don't. So I mean, I think there's good work taking place uh, through the Tower Renewal Project. I think, especially at the Scarborough storefront, um, where they're you know retrofitting the tower to be more energy efficient, better looking. They're looking at the spaces around the tower, the parking lots, and the the old sort of abandoned green spaces that rather than serving as parks around the tower seem to serve as as, um, as isolating places but like setting up farmers markets there, setting up and you know, getting what I like about what I've seen at the Scarborough storefront in particular is um, how the people of that community have been involved uh, with architects and planners in sitting down and saying, this is what we need. You know what we need? We need X and Y. Let's put, let's put it out here. And you're seeing that in other pilot project areas in some places in the city. But I think that kind of thing goes a long way. But I mean, I don't have all the answers. I'd like to see our politics produce a lot more of those answers. I know uh, I always butcher his name, although I talk to him all the time. Roger Kyle, Kyle, uh, is uh, studying so how suburbs uh, are reinventing themselves as this sort of, uh, I mean, because most of the city, and most of what we consider to be urban form, reinvented itself over a period of generations, and our, our sort of first generation commuter suburbs of the type we now think of as suburban places like Scarborough, um, they're just kind of aging out where they need to be sort of adapted and rebuilt and reinvented. And, you know, across North America, uh, People are figuring out how that works. Um, but, I mean, I think it's important that we do figure out how it works because I think the kind of, like, the, to get right back to your question, I have this tendency to ramble if you haven't noticed, um, to get right back to your question. <laughs> um, let's hear from noticing uh, uh, that the, the sort of shared prosperity and, and what not that you're asking about is only going to come because those neighborhoods become places where the people who live in them love to live and feel like they have the things that we need. Like so much of the rhetoric we have today um, is the rhetoric of resentment. Uh, both, you know, in the places like the neighborhood I live, where people resent the voters who foisted Rob Ford on us, the voters who hate bike lanes and took the one out of Jarvis Street. But especially, I think, in the rhetoric of, say, Rob Ford and his supporters, which views something like a bike lane downtown as like, like an asset you know you have that I don't have. You have this luxury good that you're installing that makes my commute a little bit harder. But like, I don't that I couldn't even use that in my neighborhood. Like, it's crazy biking out here or whatever, right? And and that exists across the board in a lot of these cases. That it, it's really kind of toxic. But I think that sort of resentment becomes resolved when the people who live in all these different neighborhoods love the neighborhood they live in, right? My parents, they call this neighborhood Riverside now, 
a South Riverdale, but it's properly called traditionally South Riverdale. There's a, like a community association there. They got federal government money to revitalize the neighborhood. It was a kind of grant that traditionally went to formerly industrial cities uh, to like rebuild their industries and economic revitalization grant. Uh, they did a lot of good work down there with that money. Part of what they did is they rebranded the neighborhood as Riverside. But when I was growing up there, it was called Southern Riverdale. Um, and it was like considered to be the WC part of Riverdale, where the factory workers live. Uh, Gerard Street is kind of the dividing line. Uh, we live right on Gerard Street, so we were straddling that line of, you know, who am I kidding? It was Main Street, which means we were in the dumb part anyway. Uh, but there was more. <laughs> Sixty-five thousand. 
Yeah, John Fillion represents even significantly more than that, right? So, so I mean, you're out of board, the Etobicoke Community Council or the Toronto East York Community Council or so on, where you want to talk about why there should or shouldn't be a speed bump on your street or why you want a bike lane on your secondary road or why uh, you're, you know, how, what can we do to get rid of the crack house at the end of the road? And you're talking to like a panel of like 10 people who represent hundreds of thousands of people and whose main job is dealing with the big issues facing the city on a regular basis. So I think without uh, tumultuously separating the core functions of municipal government back into little fiefdoms that are then going to have to find ways to negotiate with each other and deal with each other anyway, I think there are ways to devolve powers down to the community councils and possibly, as I propose in my book, and I may be pipe dream, but to like neighborhood councils, perhaps volunteer elected neighborhood councils that have significantly more control. And I would think real control, real budgetary control over some of the, the ultra local issues. Because uh, nothing pisses you off more, I think, as a resident, than a vote on a bike lane in your neighborhood if you happen to live near Jarvis Street. Uh, in which all of the councillors within 10 or 15 kilometers of where you live vote one way, the way you want them to, and all of the councillors who live way out on the outskirts of the city vote another way, and those outskirts of the city people uh, overrule you. I, I think those kind of resentments pop up everywhere, and I think we could solve that by finding mechanisms to get more people involved at the local level. Because I think right now, there are opportunities to get involved in city government. There are people in this room I know who have done quite a bit of work uh, getting crap done at City Hall. But you have to be fairly informed. You have to have a lot of spare time. You have to be able to navigate the bureaucracy. Um, and you have to live in a place where you have the kind of uh, relationship and or access to your neighbors that allows you to sort of rally to your cause, right? And that's not present in every part of the city necessarily, uh, and not every resident of the city has those kind of tools, whether they be intellectual or monetary or otherwise. And so I think the city could do a lot better job of just creating mechanisms, whatever they may be, uh, to allow people to get involved in making their own neighborhoods better, giving them real power to do that. I think the uh, which we're the Community Association is really appreciate right away. Uh, we built the, the Lake Shore. They called it when they first built it the Lake Shore LRT, but now the people who support LRT don't want us to think of streetcars when we think of LRT, so it's now the Lake Shore streetcar. Like we've done something, uh, but I, I don't think it's even controversial to say that we have not done nearly enough. That we're we're generations, a generation at least, outgrown the existing system that we have. Um, the Egerton Crosstown, I think, is a good line. I think when it, when it gets built, it will be valuable. And I think, uh, you know, it's hard because if you get into this realm of political prediction when you try to do it, but we have been fighting so bitterly over transit for the last four years, and actually before that, really for the last eight years, uh, since sort of Transit City was announced and then canceled and uncanceled and etc. You know the details. Um, that I hope, I expect, we are going to get some much needed transit. We'll have the Union Pearson Express, which I think uh, that and a lot of other go electrification projects that could provide medium term commuter service could be really useful. I think the Abrington Crosstown will be a really, really good line, especially if it functions half as well or you know three quarters as well as um, the TTC seems to think it will, and Metrolink seems to think it will. Um, I was a big fan of the Shepherd LRT. I remain a big fan of the Shepherd LRT, the Finch LRT. Um, but I have this feeling like we need to get an LRT built before so people can see how it works or how it doesn't work and fall in love with it or not. Um, but my bet would be that once they see it in operation, um, they would want more. You know, the, I think it was the mayor of Calgary that he mentioned, who said the biggest, biggest symptom of, um, of the biggest contentious issue in cities where they've built uh, modern LRT lines is that people 
constantly demand more of them. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're fighting it out, right? Uh, at some stage, it's going to take political courage. And at some stage, momentum uh, is just going to carry the day on some projects, which is, you know, let's, I feel like I should knock on wood to, uh, to be, because Anglican Crosstown seems to have enough momentum to be far enough along that it's unlikely to be canceled. But I don't want to say anything for sure uh, at this stage. I, I don't know, like I, I share your observation. I think there are some glimmers of hope. You know, turning to provincial politics though, I would say that I was really encouraged to some extent that Kathleen Wynne and the Liberal government were having this big conversation about revenue tools for so long, uh, holding public consultations and all of that, because it's like, I mean, one way or the other, we're just gonna have to pay for this stuff, but people won't accept an income tax hike or they, or at least Receive that they won't, they won't accept a sales tax hike. So we have to have a debate about new revenue tools and all of that. But I thought at least at the end of that debate, we're actually going to get a policy that's going to be committed dollars to a lot of this stuff. Um, I'm less sure about the way that debate ended that that's the case. But I mean, now Catherine has a majority government. She has an opportunity to prove that she's willing to put her money where our transit balance are and can get a lot of this bill. Um, but of course, the question is like, how can we get people to take their medicine? 
Uh, how can we get people in the media and, and their readers to be more interested in the policy issues, uh, in the, the bread and butter? And I, I'll be honest with you, like I don't know the answer to that. Like a lot of why I started doing the things I'm doing was because, first of all, it was a gig, and because I had a sort of niche there, right? Um, I could write about political issues and city hall issues for a growing group of people, small but influential, and a growing group of people who seem to be really geeky about that stuff. Uh, so in I Weekly, trying to find a place that wasn't already occupied by other city writers, there was a place to write about some of this stuff uh, from a more policy aspect. And I think Spacing Magazine has built, you know, tried to build to some extent their uh, their niche in that same audience, right? But it's not really like, like we can't kid ourselves that it's um, like the mass of people riding the subway are demanding to read about like so many issues and all of that in in their daily newspaper, right? So you have to find ways to make it interesting to them, both if you're trying to get reporters to cover the things you think are important. And if um, you're a reporter who thinks those things are important, wants to write about them, you have to find the story there, right? Find the conflict, find the characters, find the way to make it real to people, to make it something they want to read. Uh, when their other option is, you know, funny cat videos or, or you know, Netflix. Um, I thought for a while, actually, um, and, and this is like there are whole chapters in my book, uh, in which I try to discuss this, where uh, I thought for a while, pretty crack scandal, that Rob Ford was actually the vehicle for a lot of that. Because he was so polarizing, because he was so outrageous, because he made everything uh, such a great story, uh, he was sort of this centerpiece of a narrative that got us talking about transit or bike infrastructure or environmentalism or whatever. And sometimes the people I agree with were winning those debates at some city hall and sometimes they were losing them. But I have to say I was I was watching City Hall during David Miller's use and I for the record think David Miller was a, a very good mayor and a far better mayor than the one we have now. Although bag of potatoes might be a better mayor than both of them. Um, but but like there just weren't the opportunities to actually get into the policy stuff to this level, or at least not for me, right? Like I didn't have the storytelling options. The base would come up, like a proposal, like Transit City comes up, it's kind of unveiled. Everybody starts talking about you know, LRT, blah, blah, blah. And then it's sort of like rubber stamped here and there. When, when the mayor controlled a functioning majority of council, it's worth noting that David Miller uh, never lost a significant vote in the entire time he was mayor. He lost one vote that might have been considered significant, but the function of that uh, vote that he lost was to delay the implementation of taxes until after another vote a couple of months later. And a couple of months later, when that next vote was held, he had, he had managed to win the votes again to have his sort of government majority implemented as well. So when things come up as proposed, and then they're approved, and then they move on, you don't get a lot of chances to tell the stories involved in in all the policy issues. You don't you don't get too much opportunity. So I thought for a while that, you know, for all the downsides that I for one see in Rob Ford's mail, I thought, well you know what? This crap storm at City Hall is at least generating debates. And I can tell from my own uh, my own readership that people are reading about those debates. They're actually coming to pay attention to this because there's so much narrative here. There's so much drama here. Um, the fighting is so loud that everybody's kind of paying attention. Uh, and they're all fighting with each other, but at least they're fighting with each other over these policy issues. Um, and then we all start talking about crack and, and things turn the corner. Uh, so, you know, I was really hopeful that this was going to be an election about those kind of, what kind of city do we want to live in and how do we get there? These issues that seem to have been brought right to the forefront 
we brought before and has made it. Um, uh, you know, the jury's out, but it seems like we may well have a, an election that's a referendum on a, a man's personal relations. Uh, and I think there's a missed opportunity. Your question was about the media. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to tell the media what to do any better than you, but, um, you know, if we're people trying to make these stories that other people will pay attention to, we need to, we need to figure out how to tell the story in a way that it's not just a series of numbers and technical assessments. and 
uh, and things like that. And people live there. People own the land. They rent. Uh, it would be such a massive and disruptive project. Uh, that, so in addition to be generally thinking that adaptive reuse, like leaving what came before there as you build what, what's new, and not completely not in every single case, but you know at least seeing some evolution rather than a revolution. Um, that's my prejudice anyway, but I think also if we were talking about addressing the kind of problems we're talking about uh, in much of the inner suburbs or you know, challenges that we're talking about in the inner suburbs, um, like, like that would be such a massive project that first of all it would be so ridiculously expensive, but also I have no faith that we would get it right on that scale, any more right than we got it in the past. And so I think uh, there are real opportunities to use like infill and community revitalization there. And it's, I mean, the streets are really wide. It's going to be a different kind of, these, these are going to be different kinds of neighborhoods than St. Clair West or than Kensington Market. But St. Clair West and Kensington Market are already two different kinds of neighborhoods. They have a lot in common, but they're, they're distinctly different, and they both work, I think. Um, and I think, then the right kind of thinking, the right kind of energy, and the right kind of political will and investment, um, we, we might see a different kind of successful neighborhood um, in those areas we're talking about in the future. And I don't think um, that that sort of re region part beginning again with a new plan uh, is really feasible. All right. We're going to wrap up here the question session. We've gone on a little bit here, but it's a nice place to end uh, on a Reuse as we're sitting in Witchwood Barns. Uh, I want to thank Edward uh, for his talk today, and I'm sure uh, you guys would like to join me today. So thank you everyone uh, for being here tonight and we sincerely wish you all a great night.